Have you heard of the term Phasian? It's short for fake Asian. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's something that my friends and I came up with, but that's basically what I am, a Phasian. My name is Haley Yates. I was born in South Korea and adopted at five months old. I've grown up here and lived in Sydney my whole life. My parents and my extended family are all white Australians. For me, I've only ever identified as a proud Australian. I don't feel like I'm different. I don't wake up in the morning and consider how I can live my best minority life. <laughs> I've, I've gotten used to the double take. When someone meets me for the first time and my face or my accent doesn't quite match the picture in their head. I laugh about it when people say, but where are you really from? like I might be a spy with a secret identity. <laughs> Most of the time, it's easy to forget that people can make assumptions about me just based on how I look. Not long ago, when I was at university, group assignments made up a large portion of your marks. Groups were often formed in the first few weeks, usually based on who you sit with. So in that time, I noticed people scanning the room as they walked in, evaluating their options. They'd look in my direction, think it over, and then they'd sit at another table. For a while, I just assumed it's probably because I'm just not that smiley. But several subjects passed, it was still bothering me, until one of my friends said, Haley, it's probably because they think you're Asian. So I decided each time I started a new subject, I would be that person that had done all of the readings. I'd put up my hand, and I would answer all of the questions. I felt like if I put in the extra effort and I spoke up, my classmates would think I was somebody worth working with. After going above and beyond in too many subjects, I realized I was making myself work harder than everybody else just to be seen. I found myself consciously and subconsciously modifying my behavior to manage these assumptions. I found myself not wanting to buy certain items of clothing, or wear my glasses to work, in case I looked too Asian. For years, I didn't have a picture on my LinkedIn profile because I didn't want anyone to think that I wouldn't make a good communications manager because English looked like it might be my second language. I was secretly grateful to have a westernized name. And one day I realized, if this is what it's like for me, a fake Asian, what's it like for someone who's genuinely from another culture? It stands to reason, if you were raised in a culture different to the one that you end up working in, you're probably going to feel some pressure to adapt. An Australian study of people with Asian backgrounds, including India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, found that two-thirds of people surveyed felt that they needed to conform to anglicised ideas of teamwork and leadership to be successful. The irony of this is that cultural diversity, it's actually great for business. A McKinsey study of over 300 multinational companies found that companies which were in the top quartile for ethnic diversity, they were 35% more likely to have financial returns above their competitors. And when you start to look at it, there's extensive research that suggests just why this might be the case. Culturally diverse teams can produce more accurate work. By tapping into a wider variety of skills and experience, they're able to focus more on facts and remain objective. They're also more innovative. Studies have shown culturally diverse teams are more likely to develop new products. And they're also better able to solve problems and make decisions. I don't mean the kind of decisions like, what are we going to order at Yamcha? <laughs> I still get asked this quite a lot. <laughs> but decisions which reflect the diversity of an organization's staff and their customers. So, if it's so beneficial for businesses to help people feel that they can bring their whole selves to work, are we making it easy for them? When the topic of diversity comes up, it's often in relation to gender diversity. We've looked deep into the barriers to gender equality at work. The gender pay gap, female representation in senior management and on boards, the glass ceiling. 
we've become more and more educated on how to tackle the problem. Support groups, quotas versus targets. As women, we've been told to get mentored, reach higher, lean in and speak up. But what about cultural minorities? What if you're Asian and female? Do I need to lean in twice as hard? Asian American leadership author Jane Hoon coined the term the bamboo ceiling. Similar to what the glass ceiling is for women, the bamboo ceiling refers to barriers that people with Asian backgrounds face in workplaces with Western cultures. And when I first read about the bamboo ceiling, I felt a bit guilty. Guilty how I'd handled myself in those university classes and taken it upon myself to manage other people's expectations, like I was somehow reinforcing these multiple ceilings. Earlier this year, the Ascend Foundation, together with data from the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, looked at company numbers on hiring, retention, promotion um, of tech companies in Silicon Valley over a period of nine years. While Asians were the largest minority in the industry, even outnumbering white people at an entry level, they were the least likely to be promoted into management. Black and Latino representation had actually declined, and while white women seemed to be climbing the corporate ladder, minority women were just not. In fact, race had over three and a half times the negative impact on career progression than gender did. Probably the most upsetting conclusion in a sense report was that the millennial generation, my generation, is unlikely to crack the cultural ceiling. Are we seriously looking at another decade of people thinking twice about using a profile picture or their given names on a job application? When I think about legacy, it's not just something to be posthumously preserved. It's something that should drive us forward into the future and make us want to work towards something better than what we have now. Diversity and inclusion, there's so much more than a couple of mentions in an annual report, or even workshops on implicit bias. It's about shifting to a more globalized mindset and expanding our definitions of what teamwork and leadership can look like. It's time to go beyond the demographics of this issue, the who and the what. We need to be looking at the how and the why. Authentic, unrestrained conversations to look deep into the barriers that cultural minorities and their employers face. Because as far as I know, there isn't going to be a data point that's going to tell you how it feels to think your peers might be avoiding working with you just based on how you look. Or, how good it can feel to look at your organization and see diversity truly represented at every level. To break the glass, bamboo, and whatever other ceilings there may be, let's create environments where we can bring our whole selves to work. Because the next generation deserves to feel like they are enough. And because there's real strength in our differences. Thank you.